Home Coffee Roasters have a wonderful opportunity to experience and roast coffees from all over the world. And some of these coffees are processed differently than others. Some of them are dry processed coffees, some are washed coffees. And so today I'd like to focus on dry processed coffees and share some tips on how I roast them and how they might be different than roasting other coffees. So stick around. All right, thank you for joining me today and welcome to the Virtual Coffee Lab. Today we're going to be focusing on tips for roasting dry process coffee. And we're going to get to those tips in just a second. I know that there's a lot of new subscribers and there's always new home coffee roasters that are watching this channel, watching my videos. And so first I want to welcome you. Also let you know that this link up in the corner here is a great resource for you if you're learning how to roast coffee. I've got some what I call uh, cornerstone videos, videos that deal with basic coffee roasting concepts. And actually, I'm going to be referring to a lot of those during this video. And so I would strongly encourage you to check out some of those videos dealing with all of the different phases of coffee roasting that we're going to be talking about, plus several others that will be very helpful uh, to help you get up to speed and or uh, understand some of the concepts that we're talking about. All right. So before I get into my tips, I want to explain or share the difference between a washed process coffee and a dry process coffee. So a washed process coffee is where the coffee cherry is harvested off of the shrub and then it goes through a milling process where the cherry is basically the pulped where the flesh or the cherry itself is pulled away and you were left with just the coffee seed or the bean and that bean then is washed and then dried it's laid out to dry either on the ground or on like a concrete um, surface or it is laid out on raised beds where air can get to them and the beans will dry a dry process coffee is where the coffee cherry is harvested and it is then laid directly onto a hard surface and it is left there for several days to ferment and dry and then it goes through the depulping process but it is not washed it is just separated uh, the bean is separated from the cherry and the flesh and a little bit of coffee material is left on the, the bean, which is called mucilage. And some of that flavor comes over into the cup when we roast and drink that coffee. The, just the fact that the coffee was fermented in the cherry for several days is another reason why we get some fruity notes in our dry process coffee. That's not to say that a wash process coffee does not present fruity notes because they do, but this is more of a red berry flavor that is brought into the uh, tasting notes with a dried process coffee. All right, so now that we've covered some of the basics and we've bought this coffee intentionally because it's a dried process coffee and we have an expectation that we're going to get fruity notes there are really seven tips that i have for roasting a dry process coffee and let's get to those right now the first tip is that dry process coffees take heat differently than a washed coffee they seem to absorb heat quicker and that's going to cause us to be aware and us to make adjustments in several factors. The first is that we need to use a lower charge temperature. That's the temperature we put the beans in our roaster or the bean, uh, the temperature that we're going to use to roast this coffee. We're going to use a lower temperature. On my drum roaster here for a dry process coffee, I will use 10 to 15 degree lower temperature for a dry process coffee for a couple of reasons. One is because I don't want roasting defects to take place during the dry phase, this first phase of coffee roasting. And so I'm 
using a lower temperature because dry process coffees seem to be susceptible to roasting defects, more susceptible than a wash coffee. The other reason I'm using a lower temperature is because it seems like dry process coffees roast or dry quicker than a washed coffee. I have a target time uh, that I have set that I like that's comfortable for me uh, for my dry phase because it sets me up for success for the rest of my, my roast. Check out the why is the dry phase so important video if you're wondering about that. And uh, so I want to slow this progress down because dry processed coffees dry quicker. So I use a lower temperature and that kind of balances out and I have uh, my dry time be such that it's very similar to my washed coffee time. The next tip is dry processed coffees color tends to be a little different. So during the dry phase, when we're watching the beans and we're watching the color of the beans change, you'll notice that the dry processed coffees tend to take on kind of a red hue a little bit. It almost looks like they're browning and they actually are kind of browning a little bit. Um, and when we get near dry end, that's the end of the dry phase, it can be a little confusing to try to know when to call dry end on a dry processed coffee. And so the best way that, that I have, the tip that I have, is that you watch the green. You look for the color green in the bean, because we know we're waiting for it to go from a green to a yellow uh, to call dry end. And so the colors get kind of wonky, kind of crazy, and I focus on the green color so that when there's no green left, I call dry end. It's important to call our events at the right time, because if we don't, then... Our, all of our roasting phases, everything's going to be skewed and we really won't know what we have. So I encourage you to be very careful and watch the color of the coffee so that you'll know exactly when to call dry. The third tip that I have for roasting dry processed coffees is that it's all about the fruit. So we buy a dry processed coffee because we want the fruit notes. I mentioned that earlier. It's important for us to be able to have a browning phase. This is the second phase or the middle phase of coffee roasting. It's important that we have a browning phase that allows enough time for the flavors to develop and the caramelization to take place. So let's start with the caramelization. First we have mucilage. That's that outer little bit of um, slimy, it's not slimy when we get it, but it's a little bit of the film that's still left on the seed that has some sweetness to it. And we want to roast that, we want that to caramelize. So that's part of the caramelization, but also the natural sugars that are inside the bean, we want those to caramelize as well. And so we want to be sure that enough time transpires in this browning phase to let all of those wonderful complex uh, chemical reactions take place and the flavors to develop in this browning phase. I did a whole video on that and that video can be found in the playlist and it has to do with roasting, how to roast sweet and flavorful coffee. I think that's the browning phase video. That's really important. So for a dry process coffee, I want to be sure that I get at least 35%. That's really my percentage, my number of my total roast time is spent in this browning phase. And I would encourage you to consider that as well. If it's shorter than that, if you have a, um, a shorter time, if you're like 25% uh, towards 30%, you're gonna have a tart, um, you're gonna have some tartness in the coffee. And if you go longer, like 45%, 40 to 45%, you're going to start to mute some of those fruit notes and the complex uh, notes of the coffee. And so watching your rate of rise, watching how much time your browning phase lasts, that all of that is gonna influence what happens with your fruit. Whether it's a real bright coffee and a real fruity coffee, or whether you have maybe some darker notes. So, Watch your times 
uh, during that browning phase very carefully so that you can get the optimal fruit out of the dry processed coffees. All right, the fourth tip is that first crack seems to come early for a dry processed coffee, at least in my experience. And it could be for a couple of reasons. One, dry processed coffees can easily run away from you. So they, like I mentioned, coming out of that dry phase, you've got too much momentum, too much heat, and you're trying to get this coffee to slow down so you can get this extended length in the, um, the browning phase. And if you aren't able to do that and you've got all of this momentum, first crack is going to come early. It's in your, whatever your normal time is for first crack, it's going to come earlier than that. Uh, and that's if things, don't, if things don't work out, if you've made some mistakes. But if you've done everything right, first crack still tends to come a little early. And for me, I've noticed for most of the dry process coffees, if I have first crack around 386 degrees, then I may see first crack come as early as 375 to 380 degrees. And so just be aware of that. That could be a little bit of a surprise or you may notice that yourself. And again, I'd love to hear your comments to see if you've experienced some of that yourself. Um, but that's just something to be aware of that first crack can come early. And it's important to know when to call first crack. So outliers, crack, crack, right? That's not first crack, that, those are outliers. What you want is a series of cracks when you know that you've started first crack. Mark it, mark that event so you know that the time is set. And then that leads us to our fifth point, and that is, is that the development time, this is the third phase of coffee roasting, is the development time. This development time is going to be a little shorter for dry processed coffees. Now, this is a personal preference. If you're aiming for fruit, then you're going to want to try to do this. You're going to want to try to have a development time that goes anywhere from 13 to 17 percent. And I know that might seem a little surprising to some people um, because 20 percent seems to be the golden rule. That's what a lot of the experts talk about all the time, 20 percent. But I have listened to experts come out and say that they'll roast and drop a dry processed coffee earlier or a, a coffee that they want to try to get a lot of fruity notes from and not um, not really balance or mute some of those notes, they will not go the full 20%. They'll drop the coffee earlier than that. And so it's, there's several factors, there's several things we need to be thinking about if we're going to do that. One is, will the coffee be roasted all the way through? And two, um, what will my end temperature be? Because those things are really going to influence and play on how you get this 13 to 17 percent range and have a coffee that is is roasted that's not underdeveloped and um, is going to taste great. So let's talk about that for just a second. And I know this is a little bit controversial for some people, and I'd love to hear your comments and talk about that. But I'll share my experience with you, and I'll talk to you about how I'm able to do this and know that my coffee is roasted all the way through. I'm going slower through the development phase, a lower rate of rise, and so my coffee is still being roasted. The heat is, is still penetrating the coffee, but it's doing it at a lower rate. Uh, I'm not pushing the coffee as hard through this development phase. And so what that's doing is, is it's stretching out the development phase time-wise, but it's not killing me, uh, it's not killing my end temperature. So I get my development percentages that I need, the coffee is roasted all the way through, and I am able to drop that coffee at a slightly lower temperature, and I get all of the fruit that I have ever desired out of that coffee and I have not over roasted it. Uh, I have not roasted and gone past the 17% mark or so. I mean 
sometimes I mess up and I do, but my that's my goal, 13 to, to 17%. And it seems to really work. So I would encourage you, if you're trying to roast a dry process coffee and you're looking to get the fruit, here's the punchline. As you come through this middle phase, this browning phase, try to get your rate of rise down a little lower than you normally would. So I'll just mention what my rate of rise range will be just so you can get a correlation and compare. On a washed coffee, I may be at 15 or 14 uh, for my rate of rise at first crack. But on a dry process coffee, I may be down to a uh, 12 for my rate of rise. So I, have, I don't have as much intensity at that point. Uh, I did originally coming out of dry and working my way through browning, but I got that, um, I got that rate of rise down early in the browning phase so I could stretch out my browning phase and then set me up for a, um, a slower development time, giving me the temperature range that I need and the percentage that I want. I hope that makes sense. That's the best way that I can explain that. But I do that differently for dry processed coffees, and it seems to work really well for me. All right, the sixth tip is when we drop the coffee out of the roaster, the coffee's gonna look a little different than maybe a washed coffee might look. Like I mentioned before during the dry phase, the colors are a little different with dry processed coffee and there seems to be a red hue that I notice that um, as soon as the coffee comes out of the roaster, it looks like that. And you're wondering, did I roast the coffee enough? I think it might be under roasted, I'm concerned. You look and there's some color variation and you think, oh, I know, I don't think I roasted it enough because there's some color variation. And truthfully, there's color variation in dry process coffees. And, and it could be for several reasons. I can think of one reason that, uh, or one or two reasons. One is, is that the moisture content may vary from bean to bean, and that will give some variation in color. The other is, is that, and we didn't talk about this, but when a washed coffee is being processed, before it's depulped, the coffee goes and it's floated. It, it's one way that they sort the coffee by density is they float the, the cherry and the cherries separate. The dense beans seem to, I think they sink and the less dense beans float. And then I think that I might have it backwards. I'm not positive, but that's how they sort. The first sort for density is through floating the cherries and seeing them separate. And so they, with a dry process coffee, they don't have that opportunity because they're not washing, the cherry's not floating, the cherry goes right to a bed where all of it gets laid out and fermented for a few days before it's depulped. So I think that causes some variation in the color as well. Um, but just, just know that when you roast this coffee, a dry process coffee, it's going to look a little different and there'll be some color variation and not to worry. The first time I roasted a dry processed coffee, I was all worried about the color variation and the red hue. And I, uh, you break the bean open and you look at the color and the color is consistent through the bean. That's one way you should immediately check and see if you've got a, an overdeveloped or an underdeveloped uh, roast. It's just by looking at the bean through the center and checking that out and seeing if the color is consistent. All right. All right, and the last tip is all about resting. It's all about after the coffee has come out of the cooling tray and before you drink the coffee, there's a period of time that we call resting where we leave the coffee to degas and we allow, truthfully, we allow flavor development to continue. The coffee continues to develop all the way through till the cup. It is true that the flavor development changes. And we have evidence of that through this degassing process, the resting, and then ultimately later on when the coffee becomes dull after it's gotten old. So resting the coffee is going to be different, at least in my experience, for a dry process coffee. I'll tell you a story that will explain it. I went to the Mill City Coffee Roasters training boot camp for new 
um, coffee roasters. So I had this roaster on order, but I hadn't received it yet. So I went out to Minneapolis, went through roaster school, and got to roast on some of their machines. And I brought with me a couple of pounds of um, Ethiopian dry process coffee. So when the, the training was over with, I had a little bit extra time. I asked if I could roast this coffee. They gave me permission. And I went ahead and I roasted this Ethiopian dry process coffee. It ended up being a little shorter of a roast. Again, I was a new roaster and um, things didn't work out exactly as I'd hoped. But I had roasted this coffee plenty of times on a Beemore. So I was watching the color and I wasn't too far off. But I roasted this coffee and I brought it home with me. Uh, the next day I sat down to drink it and it tasted flat. And I thought, oh, you know, I messed this coffee up. I didn't roast it right. But the next day, it tasted a lot different. A lot of the flavors came out. Uh, it tasted just like the coffee that I roasted on the Be More, actually a little better. And then the next day, it got even better. And I think it was day three or four where it had peaked. And so I'm sharing this with you because my normal experience with washed coffees is that within a day, maybe two days at the most, the coffee um, tastes great. It's, it's pretty much what I had hoped for and what I was expecting to get out of it. And so there's this two to four day golden range. And then after that, uh, for me, the coffee seems to start to fizzle. The, the liveliness seems to fizzle. And so with the dry process coffee, I think it needs an extra day or so of rest, a little longer rest before you drink it. Um, and that way it'll start to come to life and you'll be able to get more of, of the notes out of it. I know that this topic is controversial. People talk, and, and I'm not so sure that, I think they're just repeating what they hear other people say, but um, at least in my experience, I'll roast a Guatemalan coffee. I can start drinking it the next day and uh, it might not be at its top best, but it's pretty good. And the next day, it's pretty much what I expected it to be. So within a couple of days. I've talked to cafes where they wait two to four days before they serve the coffee. But they're running so much coffee. And I mean, the turnover for the coffee, they basically have roasts that they do every few days. And so they've got it cycled perfectly where their coffee is always at its peak in that peak range. But I would encourage you to try that. Drink your coffee. Don't just listen to what somebody else says. Don't just listen to me. Roast a dry processed coffee. Drink it the next day. Drink it the day after that and the day after that. And mark if you notice the change in the coffee. And see um, where your range for rest would be for that coffee. And see if it's longer than any other coffee that you'd roast. I'd really be interested to hear those comments as well. You guys, I really appreciate you being here. Again, this playlist is really important. Check that out. Leave your comments, share your thoughts, ask your questions. That's what this is all about. I try to do my best to answer them. Other people have even answered questions here on this channel. And I really do appreciate the participation in, in the community here at the Virtual Coffee Lab. Thank you so much for joining me today. And I hope that you have a great week roasting.